You're a distinct player with your own musical gifts and style, and we believe that your supplies should reflect that. At The Joyous Bassoon, we offer bassoon reed tools and accessories such as drying racks, soaker cups, keychains, earrings, and more. Choose from products readily available or submit a custom order. If you can dream it, we can make it. The Joyous Bassoon, products as unique as you. Chemical City Double Reeds is a full-service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at www.chemicalcityreads.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Reed Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Jackie. <laughs> We're both wearing our own merch right now, dripping in our own merch. Yes. I mean, we had an, an appearance, quote unquote, so it's not just that we're like obsessed with our merch, but also <laughs> head on over to the merch store and treat yourself. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> How are you, Jackie? I'm good. You know, can't complain, actually, at this point. For once, I know it will surprise the listeners. <laughs> I can't complain. <laughs> How are you? So I'm good. I'm good. One week into the semester, I'm feeling fresh, feeling strong. You're ready to go. I'm ready. Oh, my God. I didn't tell you. I put a, how, I put a plant in my office. I named her. Can I tell you what her name is? Please. Her name is Sonia. The begonia. Okay, you're out. <laughs> Get out. See, I'd love to bring plants to my office, but how sad is this? My office has no windows. Oh, yeah. That's- but we got to get into it. We, oh my gosh, everyone showed up for this dish topic. Yeah, this was your idea. Full disclosure. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, let me tell you. <laughs> so the dish topic is um, double read references in the media. And what gave me the idea is I was listening to the Watch What Crappens podcast, which is a Bravo Housewives recap oh, podcast. Lord. Okay. And they love snark on the background music in these shows and they were like yeah and then when she came up the stairs it sounded like something out of peter and the wolf you know it was definitely the oboe and it was like but um but uh like obviously referencing the bassoon and the grandfather <laughs> <laughs> and i was like oh my gosh lol at these non-musician non-double read players <laughs> trying to describe the grandpa and peter and the wolf but it made me think about you know all the times that we're referenced in the media and the the fun that ensues can i tell you a reference i just thought of of classical musicians not necessarily double readers let's do it so one of my favorite shows to binge was the mentalist and there was one episode where uh the concert mistress gets murdered and spoiler alert it turns out to be obo one who did it oh (laughs) give me the solos (laughs) but at one point the main character they like the orchestra members are like hey we're going to a bar if you want to hang out and he was like uh no offense but you guys sound wonderful but it's because you spent all your formative years practicing scales so you're pretty weird (laughs) <laughs> and they were like okay <laughs> not nice to be so true okay a couple of my favorite double read references i was super happy that actually nobody in the comments on our social media got either of these mm-hmm. um so it was several years back do you remember the nfl commercial with there was a football player and he was an oboist and he was like, like this physically imposing presence. And so a football player was going through his line. He bagged groceries. I asked him one day, I was like, you ever play football? Play football? No, sir. I was like, come on, man. What do you play? I know you had to play something. I play the elbow. The what? It's a member of the Woodwind family. Oh, 
okay. You should play football. He was like, really? And I was like, play football. So he goes to the coach. What do you play? Play the oboe. You play the oboe. He walked on. Hi, I'm Chester. <laughs> I love that commercial. So oh, funny. I and love then my that. other one is from season one of Never Have I Ever where Davy and Ben are like being super competitive with each other and she shows up at the mock UN trial and he's like really put out because that's his thing and she shouldn't be infiltrating it. And he was like, this is my turf. You don't see me showing up to orchestra with a freaking bassoon. As if you had the deafness to play a double read woodwind. <laughs> <laughs> that is a slam dunk of a burn. <laughs> Oh my God. I love that. I want to send that football player some reads so that he can like get back on the oboe. Maybe we can have him on. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, did anyone go to school with Chester Pitts? We want to we talk see. to him. We can see where, his, where he went to school, <laughs> whose teacher was. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So my favorite double read reference is the, that episode from Fleabag where Fleabag's disgusting brother-in-law is talking about his son playing the bassoon and he goes, look at Jake. He is so creepy. It's not his fault. Why the bassoon? You want to know what the bassoon is? It's a cry for help. <laughs> I don't watch this show. That's so funny. A cry for help. Honestly, though, you really do have to watch Fleabag. So like I said, our listeners, they were all up in the comments ready to give us double read references. And I'm going to insist that the first one that we start with comes from my tuba youth colleague, Chris Dickey, who is like, Framley, one of my favorite people in the entire world. I told them they were going to get a shout out on the podcast. So we have hey. to. <laughs> they say in the movie Pitch Perfect, the record label owner slash producer shouts. Go, go in the corner. Go eat your lunch in the corner. But what am I going to do with my sriracha? Say one more hipster thing and I'm going to shove you in your vintage bassoon case. Okay. That first of all is very cramped. And very stinky. Yeah. Do you smell like those tech instruments? Like when you get them out for like double read tech and you open up those like super old and it's like. That <gasps> musty, acidic smell of yeah. just like 25 years of mold and mildew. And dust and. Ugh. Ugh. Horrible. That's <laughs> <laughs> Billy said Pepper Ann played the bassoon in an episode late 90s before school cartoon magic. I don't remember this cartoon. Oh, I do. Uh, Billy, <laughs> if you worried that no one was going to get your Pepper Ann reference, Pepper Ann, Pepper Ann. That song does sound familiar. Maybe I didn't watch it. <laughs> I love that she played the bassoon. Like... <laughs> I didn't remember that, but that's awesome. Okay, one that was um, very loved and referenced in Friends, Monica and Rachel's neighbor, Mr. Heckles. Yeah, and many acknowledge the ironic name that he would be Mr. Heckles. <laughs> knocks on the door and... No, no, Mr. Heckles, no one is making any noise up here. You're disturbing my oboe practice. You don't play the oboe. I could play the oboe. Oh, my God. Uh, Cassandra said, I like when I see a bassoon randomly in animated cartoons like Over the Garden Wall, Owl House, etc. Just randomly there. <laughs> Just randomly. The random bassoon. Bassoon. I know there was a bassoon reference in Family Guy as well. Was there? Yes. I just think speaking of animated bassoons. <laughs> Uh, Justine wants to shout out the Duncan commercial with the kids in the backseat going to their after school activities. Swimming, soccer, ballet, oboe, and last but not least, karate. <laughs> <laughs> Brett said the children's book by Stephen Kellogg, Ralph's 
secret weapon. Hmm. Is it a bassoon? Is that the secret weapon? I mean, I, I have been told it looks like a bazooka gun. <laughs> True. Maybe the secret <laughs> weapon. I'm not sure. Oh my gosh, Grayson, bringing me back with the Sabrina the Teenage Witch reference. Harvey plays the bassoon in an early episode. I love that. Really? What instrument do you play? Well, it's lead guitar. <laughs> lead guitar. Hey, Harvey, don't you play an instrument? Yeah, the bassoon. Wow, the bassoon. I think that's really sexy. Maybe to another bassoon. Rachel points out the most probably latest iconic reference only murders in the building is hard to beat i haven't seen that yet nor have i i can get kind of like when there is a reference like oh my gosh bassoonists do you remember when a nobel prize winner played the bassoon and he was like the bassoon helped me out and like everyone on earth sent you that article Mm -hmm. and like the 300th time you were sent the article by like your great aunt mildred that was like i don't care thought you might like to see this i see i know and every non-bassoonist in the world is like hey have you seen murders in the building it's like enough (laughs) now i'm not gonna watch it out of spite (laughs) and then barrett said not really a direct reference but loved the geico commercial with alex klein do you remember that from like 2008 no, he was in the commercial? He was in a legitimate Geico commercial. Oh my gosh. Stars. They're just like us. <laughs> That's basically what it, what it was. It was like one of those commercials that was like... Alex Klein is a real Geico customer, not a paid celebrity. So to help tell his story, we hired that guy who does those funny sound effects. My car was totaled over a thousand miles from home. <laughs> Consider buying your processed oboe and bassoon cane from those friendly folks over at Barton Cane. Processed with care and precision for your everyday reed making needs. Take the pain and injury out of reed making by letting Barton Cane do the hard, repetitive, boring stuff. Free up time for practicing, happy hours, hikes, baking, and spending time with friends and family. Barton Cane, here for you. Visit www.bartoncane.com. Specializing in the finest assortment of oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and their accessories, RDG Woodwinds serves musicians around the world. Their employees are all professional musicians who have a deep knowledge of the products that they sell. RDG's repair shop has an international reputation with a combined 100 plus years of service among the five repair technicians. Plain and simple, RDG provides excellent products and fabulous customer service. Visit them at rdgwoodwinds.com. They look forward to working with you. We are so happy to introduce you to Karen Miller, principal bassoon of the Oregon Symphony. Karen, welcome to Double Read Dish. Thank you for having me. Super honored to be here. Would you start by telling us how you started playing the bassoon? Um, okay, uh, I was about eight and I went to synagogue and my Hebrew teacher um, was a pianist at Juilliard and she brought a wind quintet from school to play a concert. And it was just like a laser beam for me with the bassoon. It was just like, what is that big, shiny, red, awesome sounding thing? And um, I went and talked to the bassoonist and he let me touch it. And I was just like smitten and begged my mom every year uh, for lessons until I was actually big enough to play for five years. And and it's just like no looking back. Thankful for those Hebrew school teachers who are also <laughs> pianists at Juilliard. <laughs> Only in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so talk to us about actually getting to start on the bassoon and falling in love with it. Uh, you went to the LaGuardia High School of the Performing Arts. So I anticipate you were kind of... Um, serious about it or um you maintained that laser focus as you finally got a bassoon in your hand so could we hear about your uh training and educational journey yes so i'm so impressed that you know that i went to laguardia that's awesome (laughs) um yeah laguardia is the the fame school for anybody who's seen that movie 
<laughs> and I actually had only been playing bassoon for like six months when I applied to LaGuardia. Wow. And I applied both for bassoon and for voice, which you would never, ever guess based on my voice. <laughs> um, but I was a really good pianist and they accepted me into the vocal program because they needed accompanists in the vocal program. So I got into both, but then I ended up sticking with bassoon and, um, you know, just being in New York and being in that spot, like right behind Lincoln Center, you're just exposed to all of the things. And, you know, we we would go hang out in the Juilliard cafeteria after school and watch all the famous people and, you know, and go to all the concerts. And um, I got to play with the New York Youth Symphony and perform in Carnegie Hall. And um, so it was just a super rich environment to grow up in. Uh, and then my last year of LaGuardia, um, my best friend, Danielle Braff, who's now Danielle Braff Carpinos, married to timpanists in the Chicago Symphony. Um, and I played the Poulenc Trio and we won this Lincoln Center Chamber Music Society thing. And we got uh, coachings with Frank Morelli. Um, and I was just, you know, so impressed with everything he was teaching me and he made us sound so much better. And so I ended up going to study with him at Juilliard afterwards. That was your hometown. You just That's stayed in your humble little Center. hometown. <laughs> Look, I'm a lucky duck. Yeah. <laughs> Talk us through the rest of your training and educational journey and how you got to where you are today. Okay. Um, so Juilliard is a very intense place. I'm sure you've had many people talk about that, um, in your episodes and, um, you know, I barely, I barely hung in there uh, through all the competition, and it was just very stressful environment, very, very toxic for me. Um, and so, I wanted to transfer. I had been studying with um, Stephen Maxim in the summers at Banff, um, and I really wanted to transfer to USC because I just adored him. And um, Juilliard's credits don't transfer, you know, it's, they have literature, literature and materials, uh, instead of theory, you know, and like everything is just like a little fancier. And so, <laughs> so nothing was transferable. So, um, I said, okay, Mr. Maxim, I want to study with you for masters. And he said, dear, I don't know if I'm going to be around then because he was already 83. Mm -hmm. So I took the year off and I went to USC and got an advanced certificate and I had my year with Mr. Maxim and it was just, amazing like best decision ever uh he's just like fluid gold you know like i just wrote everything down and have boxes of mini discs and mini discs <laughs> mini discs i don't know what i'm gonna do with them <laughs> but i have them um yeah future project um <laughs> yeah and so and so i came back to juilliard and i had another year with mr morelli and um, and then Whitney Crockett joined faculty and um, I switched to him for my senior year uh, and practiced so hard. He's such an inspiring presence and just sounded amazing. I went to hear the Met every weekend um, and hear him play. And um, and then I was fortunate enough to get into Rice for Masters um, by the skin of my teeth, I'm sure. Uh, and, you know, and I went through Ben Kamen's boot camp and don't know I'd be where I am without it. Um, he really set me straight, taught me flicking. And, um, you know, I practiced, I don't know, seven hours a day to keep up with my seven etudes a week and make my six reads a week and um, went through the grinder and and came out and um, got really lucky. I moved, after graduating, I moved to Chicago to play with the Civic Orchestra. And I was, it was like a big question mark. I, I got it off the wait list. And I moved, I was like, found, I did Spoleto that summer and I met these people and they were like, we have an apartment that has an extra bed. Like you could just crash with us. So I like sent a box to Chicago and like moved there for a week. And then I got a call from the Shreveport Symphony that they needed a one year um, player. And so I moved to Shreveport, Louisiana, nice Jewish girl from New York. Um, and... <laughs> So that was an experience. And I, I really, I had a really wonderful time. The people in that orchestra were just incredible people. Um, really, they took me under their wing and like taught me the ways. And I got my first, cut my teeth um, in my first gig. And then, um, 
And then I auditioned for Jacksonville. I, I, Jacksonville was at the end of like four or five auditions all in a row. So when I showed up, I didn't even know what the list was because I just had this giant book of excerpts and I was like, what am I playing today? And, um, and, you know, I think that's, there's really something to that to just like be so prepared and just, you know, who knows what they need and just be ready. Um, and so Jacksonville gave me a six week trial. I was Gabriel Beavers and I both had six week trials, um, which was very intense. I took Alicia Harazad and Muller One and all these things. And, um, um, and then I got the gig and moved to Florida for three years. Also Jewish girl from New York did not fit in there either. And when this opened in, in Portland, I just, you know, locked myself in my, uh, walk in closet and practice till two in the morning. Cause I was like, I need, need to be in Portland. <laughs> uh, and they actually didn't hire anyone. My first audition here either. And, uh, uh, the music director took me in his office and said, you were this close to winning the job. And I was like, give me a trial, like, you know, something. And he said, no. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I practiced harder and I got it the next time straight out. And I've been here ever since. It's been about 11, 12 years now. I want to hear more about that process. But uh, before we go deeper into that, um, Stephen Maxim is one of these figures that um, anytime you speak to one of his students, they just speak so... Um, it's a love. It's like a real love. I find uh, the way that Maxim students speak about him, and we will never get to interview Mr. Maxim, unfortunately. So, could we hear a little bit about what he was like and why he was so special to you? Absolutely. And I, I do have a project down the line to compilate those um, into like a CD or something, so that everyone oh. can can learn those lessons from him. But um, he was just um, he was just kind of a magician. Uh, with his teaching, you know, it was very, it's a very poetic style of teaching. Um, and he just had a way of really unlocking everybody's potential. Like he just, he saw straight to the heart of the issue and like knew how to unlock the issue, you know, like for me, I was, I would do great in practice and everything. And then I would go to perform and I would get really timid. And he was like, you just need to perform. It's like, and he would say that I'd be playing and he'd be like, perform. And then I would sound like 20 times better. You know, like he just knew the key. He knew, he knew what to say. Um, and he had all of these, um, vocal techniques about getting around the instrument, um, to make you feel like you were really able to express yourself and sing and, um, and not be like fumbling around a bassoon, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so I use those in all of my teaching, you know, specific kinds of support, ways of thinking about treating high notes and, um, yeah. And he was just a, a lovely guy. He was just so sweet. Like at Banff, he took us out for ice cream, you know, and we all went to Lake Louise and like, he was just lovable. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I would drive to his house in Laguna Hills, which was like an hour and a half from, from my place in LA, you know, and and we would have these really long lessons and um it just felt like it just felt like the wisdom of you know golden wisdom just pouring in uh and then i would go home and write it all down okay now can we hear more about your experience winning your position with the oregon symphony what was that day like yeah, that's a really good question. So I'm big into mental prep for auditions. I do a lot. I've done a lot of Don Green. I've read all of his books and done his website, um, you know, and um, for this one, I don't even remember who recommended um, Creative Visualization by Shakti Gawain, which now that I go back and read it, I'm like, this is really like a little bit sketchy, like there's a lot of God stuff and a lot, it's not, it's not really, uh, but, but for, it's, it's what I needed at that time. Like I, I was able to sift through it to take the messages I needed mm -hmm. at that time. And he had some really powerful exercises that were just visualizing the exact moment. Um, and I love to tell this story cause it's like one of those moments for me. Like I, the night before the audition, I actually did a walking meditation. So Portland, I went to the yoga studio and we had this like walking meditation and, um, I just used the, the visualization exercises, um, in this meditation of just like imagining 
exactly what it was going to look like and feel like and sound like. And then I imagined exactly where I'd be standing in the green room and the position of like where I would be in the music director and how he would be looking at me and what he would say when I won. And I swear to you that it played out verbatim for what I, it's like, I feel like I manifested that moment. Mm -hmm. Um, so I really, I really believe in the power of, um, visualization and mental thought and how it, how it applies to your performance. How did it feel when they said, it's you, you're the, you're the winner. What was that moment like? I mean, because I had visualized that feeling already, it felt right. I was just like, oh yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Duh. Of course, really yeah, of course I won. <laughs> yeah, it really happened. Yeah. But also, you know, the because I didn't get it the first time, that really lit a fire on, you know, under my belly. And um I literally I had this, I called it my sky pod in Jacksonville, this tiny little apartment on the water. And there's a walk-in closet in the middle of the apartment that had no adjoining uh walls to the other apartments. So I was able to practice till two in the morning. And I would, I would just, I'd have my five books for Jacksonville, like all the notes that I had to learn. And then I would go play Beethoven 400 times in the closet until two in the morning. Cause I was so determined to, to live here and be in Portland. Um, when I walked into the warm up room, you know, how you walk into the warm up room and it's always so intimidating. It's like everyone's playing loud and fast and everybody sounds so amazing. Everybody looks so fierce, right? You know? <laughs> And this was one of the few times that I was so prepared that I walked in and I was just like, I'm really sorry you all are going to have to go home because I'm more prepared than all of you, you know? <laughs> yeah. And and just, I feel like I ate a steak the night before, you know, it's just like, just feeling that like fierceness. And, and I think that only comes from a level of preparation. It's just, you know, when you, when you really know that you've done absolutely everything you could possibly do. So um, what was, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. No, <laughs> what was the difference between your preparation the first time and your preparation the second time? Oh, good question. So, you know, I, for me, I have a really hard time with change. Uh, that's always been my issue with auditions is like, I want it, but, but then there's this like non-committal, like I'm happy where I am. Like, do I really want this big change? Maybe, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and so I think that's part of the reason I didn't get it the first time because I wanted it, but did I want it? It wasn't a huge pay increase from Jacksonville, you know, I'm like, I didn't, I wasn't sure. Uh, But then I got off the plane and I was like, holy moly, I have to live here, you know? Mm. So the second time, yeah, the second time, like the first time I walked all around the city and I, I went to this bakery that had like healthy, uber healthy or extra healthy bread. <laughs> and I was like, this is my city. Um, you know, it's like so Pacific Northwest. Um, and I was just like falling in love with the city and I wanted it too much. You can't want it that much um, because you'll, you'll just choke. Like you have to want it enough, <laughs> but not that much. And so the second time I specific, I called the hotel and I requested a room without windows. <laughs> <laughs> and I just like, I just was like blinders the whole time. I, I I got out of the car and I walked into the hotel and I practiced and I went to sleep and I was just like, I could I could be anywhere. I'm not in Portland. I'm just mm. here to play my best and do a walking meditation. <laughs> <laughs> so though there are some, you know, and some very noted, unfortunately, especially in the United States, we don't have a ton of women in principal bassoon chairs and as such you know you are this um role model and representation and one of the few women especially in a a major huge orchestra like you're in you know who get to have that role and i wonder if you could talk to us a bit about maybe more generally what makes a great principal bassoonist but also being a woman in that place that you hold Okay, we could spend like three hours on this. Um, I'll try to focus it in. Part of the reason that I kept taking auditions until I got this is that I never felt like I had, you know, the same respect or equality um, as in that chair. Um, there's there's so many boys clubs, uh, and so, um, and I didn't feel that here. I, I I really, you know, 
my music director and I like have complex, like, you know, there's good things and bad things, but I will always be grateful that he respects women. And there are a lot of women in title positions in this orchestra. And that's part of the reason it feels like a good fit. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think what makes a great principal bassoonist is somebody who is really confident in what they're doing and doing the work, uh, and setting by example and leading and, um, always prepared and respectful and polite and, um, also able, like hold themselves to an extreme standard, but also, but not hold anybody else to that standard, just allowing people to be who they are and um just recognizing that we're all human and like we're all doing our best and um you know and and that the the best outcomes are going to come if we all just accept it and support each other um uh and i that was a hard as a conservatory brat that was a hard lesson it took me a while to learn that honestly Mm -hmm. um because you know you hold yourself to such a high standard it's hard not to hold other people to that standard Mm-hmm. Uh, until you, your frontal cortex fully develops and then you're like, oh, you know, we're all people and everybody has a story, <laughs> you know, everybody's, everybody's doing their best. So, mm-hmm. um, and, and why it's so hard for women. I, I mean, I think that's such a systemic issue and I am so excited to see the changes that I'm seeing now, mm-hmm. you know, with the Fem Power group and with you guys and like, just, um, just getting, there's like, you know, the Double Read Society is trying, everybody's trying to get to, to just change that trajectory. Um, but I think a big part of it, I listened to Sue Heineman's podcast with you guys, and I loved what she said that she studied with these major women and she never thought twice about being a woman and doing it. And I think that that's a big part of it. Like all of my teachers were men, you know, um, and they were all wonderful men and they gave me everything they could, you know, but I just never, um, I never had that role model. I had Judith LeClaire growing up in New York. That was really something um, just to see her in that position. Um, but I think uh, just having more women in these positions, mentoring other women is really a big part of the key just to feel like, you know, you're not, you're not different. You can do this just as much as anybody can, you know? You know, before we had blind auditions, we had you just go to the conductor's hotel room and play for him and, you know, super sketch. And then now we have blind auditions and that's becoming more of a debated topic. And I was wondering, what are your thoughts on the blind audition? Yeah, I I actually I'm on the DEI audition task force and the DEI committee um, with the Oregon Symphony. So I've done a lot of thinking about this and I I think that the the screen is part of it, but I think that there is a different, this is just my opinion, qualifier, like, you know, this is not gospel. I, this is just what I think, is that there, there are very different aesthetic priorities um, between men and women. And not always, not always, but just in, in general. Um, and I think that committee makeup actually plays a really big role in who gets hired because I've seen- Such a good point. Yeah, like I've looked, you know, I watched, I, I've idolized the Met my whole life growing up in New York and I studied with Whitney and, um, you know, I watched this, this broadcast o- over COVID of this beautiful Grand Partita performance and it was like, where are the women? There's Elaine Duvass, you know, and there was one uh, second clarinetist, I think, and the rest were all men. And I'm like, this is an orchestra that hires from behind a screen, you know? What, why is this happening? Mm. It's not, and, and I know that it's not that the men were all better, you know, mm-hmm. like I, it's either, and actually I, I've been, I, I messaged Catherine Needleman about it and we were like trying to get to the bottom of like, what is the cause of this, you know, and it's either that women don't have the same leg up throughout their career because of the boys club vibe, you know, that they're just not given the same opportunities um, or the same instruments or the same, you know what I mean? Like they're just not. It's either that or they're just discouraged along the way because they don't have enough role models and mm. or it's that there's equal 50-50 showing up to the audition but that the committee is all men and they're choosing for that aesthetic um you know it's just a different priority. Mm-hmm. Can can I share with you something that I've never shared on the podcast? Yes, please. When I was in grad school, I was approached by an older grad student 
um, who told me that he thought that I should not play oboe and just go into voice because it has more opportunities for women. Oh my God. I yeah. don't sing. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> You're like so let me sing for you and then say that again. <laughs> like maybe that happens to other women too. I don't know. Yeah, on a subtle on a subtle and constant level. I think it's just like this constant drip of like subconscious messaging. Yeah. Related, now you have had the chance to be on the other side of the screen. And I wonder what lessons you've learned from being on um, hiring committees and what advice you have for listeners who are still searching for their perfect fit. So really, you just have to sound the best. <laughs> you just have to be the best one. Um, but no, no, all, all joking aside, um, I think I think it's a transmission of energy, you know, and pardon me for being so Pacific Northwest in my answer, but um, but I but I think that, you know, your intent, whatever your intent is on the stage is going to come straight across. And so if your intent is like, I don't belong here, you know, all these people sound better than me, I'm going to do my best, but, you know, then that's what comes across. And if your intent is I'm going to win this and I'm going to play the best I possibly can. And you would be lucky to have me in this group. And I absolutely belong here. Then that comes across, you know, and it, it's, it affects the way you play, but it also is an energy that is, is directly translated to the listener. Mm -hmm. um, so my advice to people playing auditions is inspire your committee, you know, make them, make them excited about music. You know, like make them sit on the edge of their seat to hear your phrase. Um, you know, like it's there, you know, obviously every all your eyes have to be dotted and all your T's have to be crossed. There really there was no room for error. Um, like you really have to be prepared to just deliver everything as it is. And then you need to say something and, and really um you know, put your heart on your sleeve and put yourself out there. Personality really matters, especially for principal chairs, you know, mm -hmm. um, we, people, people are looking for someone who they're going to be married to musically for the next right. 50 years, potentially, you know, and they want somebody who's going to make them want to come to work and bring their best, you know, they don't want someone who's going to like, just cut it, you know, or like, be the cog in the machine. They want somebody who's going to inspire them to do better. Right. So, so that's my advice is, is, is be inspiring. Well, as if being principal bassoon in this huge orchestra was not enough on your plate, you started bassoons without borders and has now had three sessions. And I'd love to hear about what inspired you to start bassoons without borders. Um, tell us a little bit about, um, the the program and and what people could expect from participating and 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 yeah what motivated you to take on this huge thing yeah um okay so i i as a new yorker i'm not somebody who knows how to sit still it's probably something i need to work on but i i, I love having like projects and doing i'm just like a doer um and so before COVID, I was playing with the opera and the ballet and teaching, you know, eight students and playing in the symphony and teaching at PSU and read college, you know, and, and raising my son and doing a garden and chickens. Like that's, that's my jam is like, I need to be doing like, you know, a lot of things at once. And then COVID hit and I was just like spinning like a ball, like, what am I doing? This is not going to work for me. Um, and so, um, you know, my students, it hit my students so hard and I love them so much. And they came to me with these puppy dog eyes um, and they were like, is a lava lake woodwind camp not going to happen this year? And I was like, oh, it's going to happen. We're going to do something even better. <laughs> you know, I was like, I'm not going to let you be sad about this. Like, we're going to make the best of this opportunity. Um, and I just realized, like, this is a global pandemic and like, Sophie Dervo is sitting on her couch right now. And, you know, Gustavo Nunez is sitting on his couch right now. And like, everybody wants to help. The students need inspiration. The artists need to feel relevant. You know, like, easy peasy, let's connect these two. And like, the Zoom thing took off and we all figured out how to use it. And it just, it was so magical. It just, 
it just worked out. Um, and, you know, I didn't know what I was doing at all. Like I've never run anything, you know, I was just determined, like, we're gonna, we're gonna, these kids are gonna get inspiration. These artists are gonna feel like worthy, you know, like mm -hmm. they, they need an outlet to give what they've gotten, you know, it's really important. Um, and so I just started cold emailing people like, how much would you want for like a 90 minute class in some like random Zoom camp, you know? And um, and Sue Heinemann again sent me straight and she was like, well, you need to come up with a rate that's like equal for everybody. Um, and uh, and I was like, obviously, thank you. <laughs> you, know, like, duh. you know, I was just like just totally spitballing. Um, and uh, And then I realized some of the artists that I wanted to include would probably require a really high rate. So I set a really high rate and I was just determined to get enough registrations to pay that, pay for that. So, mm -hmm. um, and because of that, I was able to get really great artists. And then I just spun my wheels and sent hundreds of emails uh, and got the word out and, pe and people really needed it. It was just the right thing at the right time. People just really needed it. And so we had, I think 60 registrants for the first session um, and it went so well. It was just like such an inspiring session. Um, and so then we did a winter session that was much shorter and it was also just like amazing. We also had about 55 people. And then we did another summer session, but I think at that point people were so done with Zoom that it was a little harder. Um, so I'm not sure how to continue because I think people are still pretty done with Zoom. Um, <laughs> But we might do just like a short, I think we'll probably do like a two or three day thing because it's, it really is inspiring. Um, we just need smaller screen doses, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is a double read podcast. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about reads. Okay. Would you be willing to share maybe some read making advice that you have or some great read making advice that you've been given? Sure. And some of our listeners, like the real nerdy stuff of like, what shape do you use? What, you know, like they want the nitty gritty, if you're willing to share. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll start with an apologies to anybody who's not a bassoonist listening to this. Um, <laughs> um, so reads, um, I, I've studied with such an array of styles, uh, teachers from different styles that i really have like a weird amalgam of, of everything that's that's my thing i'm like a maximalist and so i'm like we're gonna learn everything <laughs> and then figure out how to put it all together um and so i am so like that too really oh yeah, yeah. it's, it's, it's like, like oh it's too much my students are like it's too much it's, too much. <laughs> it's yeah i mean i'm trying that's my challenge is to like really focus in and distill all the knowledge that i've gained <laughs> um and I'm still working on that. Um, but, you know, part of my COVID project was experimenting with read shapes. And I have, I don't know, like, it's really embarrassing. I think I have like 20 shapes that I'm using regularly now. Amazing. Um, yeah. And I've narrowed it down to about like six <laughs> that I really like. <laughs> But with that, that all led me to realize that I just needed a different instrument. So I actually, I bought a Valter, um, which I adore, and that sort of fixed everything I was looking for with reeds. Um, and so now I just am like finding the right, in, right reeds for that instrument. Um, but, uh, but I would say in my rotation, I'm still, I'm still holding on to that Hertzberg reed style. It feels like home to me. Um, it really does all the things I want it to. And then um, the CDN, the Crocodonzi narrow shape from Fox is working really well on my Walter. And um, what else do I have? I have those, those Donzi 9.2 are really useful for certain things. Um, and the Otto Eifert shape is really interesting to me. I'm still trying to get it uh, to work all the way, but it has some beautiful qualities that I love. Um, and then the Rieger 1A, which is just, um, you know, I use that in undergrad and it, um, it does a lot of what I wanted to do, but I'm starting to realize that I don't think I'm one of those people that just plays on one shape. I think, you know, like when I play Prokofiev, I really want to have a beefy sound, you know, and you can't, I can't really get that on the Hertzberg. So for that, I'm going to use the Donzi, you know, and uh, for, you know, for a piano, we did Rachmaninoff piano concerto and I was like, I need flexibility. I need response. I need fluid sound. I need tonal colors. And so I used a Hertzberg read for that, you know, mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think that's going to be, hopefully I can just get it to two or three so that it's not like, oh, <laughs> so that it's a little more focused and, um, uh, but, but I'm also learning the Chris Lieb shape for the Indiana University students. Um, Kathleen McLean teaches the Chris Lieb shape and they're all playing on that and, um, and I'm really enjoying it and I'm using it for certain things as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not super focused, but I have a lot of knowledge and I feel like that has really helped me in my teaching as well because I feel like I really understand reads in a different way having made all these different kinds of reads. Yeah, well, and that, I don't know, hints at or insinuates someone who's willing to depart from say like tradition or lineage or something in, in lieu of what's best for you. And I'd love to hear about your choice to play a Walter Bassoon because, because I so associate the orchestral world with the mystique of Heckel. And I right. wonder if that was a choice that like, was it just this what is what works for me? Or was that something you had to like consider? Was there any baggage with that choice? Oh, there's still so much baggage, but <laughs> one of the beauties of being in your 40s is, is that you stop caring what other people think as much, oh my God, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It's so Love great, it. isn't it? <laughs> I'm not, I'm almost there. We're not quite there. Almost there. And I can't, it's like starting to shift. I'm like, Ooh, yes, I see it. <laughs> so it's so freeing. It's like, this is what I want, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and, and everybody seems to like it. Like I do take my colleagues reactions, you know, I've been really playing it for people. A lot of people can't tell that I'm not on my heckle still, which is hilarious to me because it plays so differently. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we all have a way of just sounding like ourselves on whatever, you know. Yeah. Um, but I do think the heckle mystique is disappearing with the prices of heckles right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing so many more professionals playing bells and foxes and um, alternatives. Um, but this this falter, it's funny. So Sam Roten, who's a, a fresh uh, a first year grad student at Rice, um, is from Oregon and we, we've been, you know, we've had a relationship over the years and he's taken lessons here and there. And I worked with him virtually last year when he was auditioning for Rice. And, um, he sent me the Eifert shape and I bought it and I loved it. And then he sent me the listing for this falter and he was like, I'm just saying you should try this. And I trust Sam. So I emailed anyone <laughs> who was selling it i mean i really I, I hemmed and hawed for like a week and i was like i'm not gonna try a vault or what is this but um i emailed eddie and um and we we had a back and forth and he was like well i'm gonna be in chicago at this time and i was like i'm gonna be in chicago playing grant park like it just was like kismet how mm -hmm. it worked out and so i tried it and then you know nicole and marty who were playing in grant park came with me to try it. And so they heard me on my bassoon, they heard me on this and they were like, I like the Valter better. And then they played my bassoon and the Valter. And I said, I like the Valter better. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and then Marty told me about this, uh, you know, this Actors Federal Credit Union that's only in Chicago, New York. You have to be a member of the Chicago Union to, to join to join this credit union that gives instrument loans. And I happened to be playing with Grant Park of those three weeks. So I joined the union and got this loan and just bought it. <laughs> it was just like this bold choice. And I was just, and I, my, my poor heckle has not come out of the case once since I first tried this falter. I just oh, love it. So cool. I love it. Well, and I should mention it's Danny Matsukawa's um, former instrument. And so there's like a real prestige to it, you know, and that, that helps with the decision. I'm like, this instrument was played in the Philadelphia orchestra. Therefore right. it's okay. It's tried and tested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but I love it. I really, I just, I love it. Okay. So we're traveling to a hypothetical dream world in which the Oregon symphony comes to you and says, Karen, we're at a loss. We have one concert that we need to have programmed your choice whatever you want what are you gonna put on the program what's your like dream scenario for a concert okay well as a maximalist i'm gonna answer <laughs> uh john williams five sacred trees because that's a bucket list piece um that i've always wanted to play um john adams city noir and messi and <laughs> I know anyone could sit through that concert, <laughs> but I would have a lot of fun. <laughs> I love it, but I can't think of another 
person we've said who said Turin Galela Symphony. That is a new one. <laughs> oh, it's so incredible to it sing the middle of that piece. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, can we hear about a special memory from a past performance uh, that you have? I mean, I think probably the highlight of my career to date was when Oregon Symphony went to Carnegie for, as part of the Spring for Music program. Um, and they put together this super intense program. It was um, John Adams, the wound dresser, Ataka, um, Symphonia Domestica, Ataka, um, Ives Unanswered Question, Ataka, Von Williams 4. Like no breaks, wow. no intermission, and you're just like playing through this whole thing. I, I think I got that order wrong, but... Um, but the Vaughn Williams is just a really muscular, like intense, rigorous piece. Um, and, you know, our orchestra is like just way beyond the level that it should be um, for given our pay rate. Um, <laughs> but there's some really committed, um, you know, artists with real integrity in the orchestra. And like we have suffered on our stage for so long. Uh, just not being able to hear anything. We play in this big dead shoebox um, theater. Mm -hmm. And so you put us on a stage like Carnegie and we could actually hear each other. And I mean, the energy was just unbelievable. Like we were like, we are an orchestra, like we can really play. And like, if we have the right acoustic, we can actually really play. Um, and I don't know, it was just, it was just balls to the wall for the entire performance. It was so incredible. Um, to play and Alex Ross wrote us this glowing review and it's like uh, that was that was kind of the highlight um, for this for my my time in this orchestra to date. The good news is they fixed the acoustic in our hall now with a um, good. an electronic enhancement system. So that okay, I know <laughs> electronic enhancement system. Like, whatever works, you know, yeah. it's working. Yeah. So that is a beautiful memory. And now I was wondering if you might share with us perhaps something embarrassing that has happened to you on the stage or funny or something memorable, maybe for a different reason. <laughs> okay. Um, so embarrassing, um, this only happened once. And this is the good thing about embarrassing stories is that once they happen, you're likely to never let them happen again. <laughs> um <laughs> But, you know, th this orchestra, for some reason, for many years, we had inconsistent start times to our concerts. It's like somewhere at 730 and somewhere at 8. And oh, God, nightmare. Nightmare. And everybody's always like at the end, they're like, see you at 2 tomorrow. Like, see you at 730 tomorrow. Like, just like checking and making sure we're like at all of the right start time. I got it wrong. And I was, I don't remember, I was like... I was like shopping on my bike or whatever. And I got a call and it was like five minutes till the start of the concert. No. Yeah. Oh my God. Actual nightmare. Actually, no, like I, I actually have had nightmares. <laughs> this, and I was like, am I in a nightmare? Like, is this actually <laughs> happening? But I, I mean, I biked like I, I biked like an insane person and I managed to only get there like six or seven minutes late, but, but the whole orchestra was on stage just waiting for me. And the music director, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he like made a joke to the audience cause they all like clapped when I walk on stage. It was, oh, it was just beyond like, please don't ever let that happen to anybody else. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. I mean the shame for like years <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> I have very forgiving, lovely colleagues, and nobody's chiding me about it to this day. So, <laughs> <laughs> except your subconscious while except you're sleeping. <laughs> I maybe that's why I can't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, our favorite question to close with is: What advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? Awesome. Awesome. I say, do it. If you want it, do it. Um, if you're on the fence, question that. Um, but if, if it really excites you, um, don't listen to what anybody says. You know, people are going to say, oh, it's really hard. You can't do it or you shouldn't do it. 
Um, but if you want it, if it makes your heart sing, then find a way to do it. Um, my, my feeling is that there's not one formula to make this happen. Um, I, I, I view it as a ratio of um, innate talent to commitment to discipline. Uh, and some people have like their innate talent is sky high and the discipline is low and they manage to make it riding on their talent. Some people have very low innate talent, but they are so committed and so disciplined that they find a way to make it happen. Um, and so I think I, you know, maybe, maybe this is Pollyanna pie in the sky, but I believe that anybody who wants it badly enough can do it. Um, uh, you know, it's just a matter of how hard you're willing to work. So I, I say, you know, if you love what, if you love it, there's no better profession. Like I feel so excited about my job. I literally skip to work. I'm like so happy to be doing what I do. It is so fulfilling, you know, and musicians are so awesome. That's why I went into music because I love musicians. I was like, these are my people. This is what I'm doing, you know? Um, and so just being surrounded with your people and playing great art and having, you know, your your challenges handed to you on a silver platter week after week. It's just there is it's really a privilege. So, um, you know, just it's worth it. It's worth the work. Put the blinders on, lock yourself in that closet, play Beethoven 400 times and make it happen. Karen Miller, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. We're so grateful and happy that you joined us for this episode of Double Read Dish. Thank you, guys. It's such a privilege to actually talk with you and not just hear you interview other people. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> We don't have to hope. We know you enjoyed that delightful interview with Karen Miller Packwood. How could you not? How could you not? What a joy. Please, if you would be so kind, go rate and review on iTunes, follow us on social media, join the consortium if you haven't done that yet. Check out our merch and check us out ooh, at the University of Nebraska Double Read Day, which is coming up. Learn more about that on our social media and uh, look for updates about a potential live show, even if you're not in the Lincoln area. Galit, who's coming up on our next episode. We have such a fantastic conversation with Jung Choi, Assistant Professor of Oboe at the University of North Texas, Jackie, and the Nerd Parade already. Go make reads.